Good morning. What an absolute delight it is to be able to gather again this morning, not gathered in our church building, but gathered together and linked spiritually and sharing God's word on this virtual platform. So a real warm word of welcome to you this morning. I would like to read this morning as a call to worship one of the Psalms of Ascent. This is Psalm 126. It's a joyful psalm. So we read this as our call to worship this morning. When the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, we were like people who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. Let us pray. Lord, as we gather this morning, we come before you just as we are. You know each one of us. We are your sons, we are your daughters, and you are our Father. We come before you asking for your mercy. We come before you asking for forgiveness for the things that we have done that we ought not to have done and for those things we've left undone that we ought to have done. Help us, Lord, to live a life that reflects your life, that reflects your glory. We pray now, Lord, that you would still our minds, still our hearts, still our souls as we share thoughts on your word this morning. Be with us this morning, Lord. We ask this in your precious and wonderful name. Amen. Philippi was a prosperous Roman colony in the mountains north of Greece in Macedonia. And many of the Philippians who lived there were retired Roman soldiers, often sent out their given land in order to go and retire in that colony. And they also provided a military force in case this was ever needed in the frontier city. Philippi was strategically located from a geographic point of view, and commercially it was prosperous. It was on the Via Ignatia. Gold and silver were mined in Philippi, and the citizens were Roman citizens. The Roman law applied there. The citizens spoke Latin. They dressed like those in Rome. There were very few Jewish persons living there, and there was no synagogue in Philippi. And this probably explains why Paul doesn't quote any Old Testament passages in his letter to the Philippians. But in Acts, we read about the fact that there was a place at the river where women gathered to pray. And we read in the book of Acts that when Paul and his companions went to Philippi on the Sabbath, they went down to the river and gathered there. And Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth, members of her household and some family friends, I guess, gathered there and were converted. They were baptized and became followers of Christ. And they offered hospitality to Paul, to Silas and Timothy, who spent time with them. And Lydia and her followers were the nucleus of this small church in Philippi. They had supported Paul financially and they continue to do so even when Paul was under house arrest in Rome. And so Paul starts this letter to those at Philippi like this reading from verse 3 of chapter 1. I thank my God every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. 
For whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. One can only imagine the joy with which Paul wrote this letter, and one can only imagine the joy with which this letter was received. And this letter by Paul to the Philippians, just four chapters, has been described in the following way. And I love this. This is Paul's happiest letter, and the happiness is infectious. Before we read a dozen lines, we begin to feel the joy ourselves. The dance of words and the exclamations of delight have a way of getting right inside us. Paul doesn't tell us how we can be happy or how to be happy. He simply and unmistakably is happy. And this despite the fact that Paul's circumstances were anything but happy at that time. When he wrote to those at Philippi, he was under house arrest in Rome, awaiting trial, and he had been for some two years. But we read that even though he was confined in this way, restricted, this didn't in any way confine his sharing the gospel or sharing his joy. And we need to remember that under the Roman system, a prisoner would have had to provide for his own rent, provide financially for his own place to stay, his food, his blankets, writing materials, anything else that he might have required. And Paul was probably chained to a Roman soldier day in and day out. So he probably dictated the letter and somebody else wrote it down for him. Last week, if you were at church or if you could listen on YouTube or on another platform, Lincoln preached on Philippians 1 verses 21 to 30, and he pointed out how Paul exhorts us to live a life of service, a life that is not one that is self-centered or self-exalting, but a life worthy of the gospel of Christ. And he said that at this time, where individualism is the priority, where individualism reigns, we are firstly to stand firm in one spirit. We are to be united, to have the same disposition, the same character and a common purpose. And secondly, we are to contend as one person for the faith of the gospel, united, not to have disunity, each one accepting that in the body of Christ, each one of us has a particular calling and a particular purpose. And this morning's passage follows immediately on after that passage. And we look at the first 13 verses of chapter 2. Paul continues here exhorting those at Philippi to take the focus off themselves, not to be self-centered rather to consider the interests of others and to imitate the humility of Christ. But listen to the powerful writing of Paul as he starts here. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Powerful writing to those receiving this letter. And joy is just bubbling out. Some have called this letter the epistle of happiness. But Paul says, go further, make my joy complete. Make my joy complete by making sure that you do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but rather at all times consider the interests of others and reflect the attitude and the humility of Christ. Paul's teaching is that being like-minded brings unity, and when we work against each other, disunity reigns. Disunity comes from selfish 
ambition and vain conceit, putting ourselves first at all times. And then in these 13 verses, we get to the beautiful poetic description of the humanity of Christ, the poetic and even lyric character of this writing has led many to say that this was possibly an ancient hymn that Paul has adapted as he writes to the Philippians. But whether this is so or not, these verses express Paul's conviction as he describes Christ's humiliation and Christ's exaltation. Christ's humiliation in verses 6 to 8 and Christ's exaltation in verses 9 through to 11. In regard to Christ's humiliation, the following, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Paul is stressing here that Jesus is fully God, having those qualities that make God specifically God. Jesus had these qualities, but he didn't grasp them in the sense that he was prepared to let them go. It was not, it was something that he was prepared to give up. He didn't just hold on to this. Why did he give it up? He gave it up for us. He let this high position go so that he could take our place. And we read there, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. Jesus, as the servant leader, exemplified, for example, when he washes the feet of the disciples in order to give them the example of serving others, made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. And then Jesus, fully man, humbled himself in absolute obedience by going to the cross, even to death on the cross. And Jesus died as someone cursed. Crucifixion in those days was the most degrading kind of execution that could be inflicted on any person. In Galatians we read, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. And then the poetic hymn goes on to deal with the exaltation of Christ. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. And that is followed by, by those lines that we know very well. It says, Jesus exalted so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So Paul has set out Christ's humiliation but also the exaltation that followed on his absolute obedience and he says make my joy complete. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but act in humility with an attitude the same as that of Jesus. Act in humility with an attitude the same as that of Jesus. And then in the passage, Paul continues giving instructions to those at Philippi as he gives instructions to us here and now. Instruction that is appropriate at all times, but may be of particular importance during these times when we face restrictions as a result of COVID-19 and the current pandemic. A time when we've been separated from meeting physically together. Paul writes then, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. To put this in our terms, we might write, Therefore, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, 
not only when you can meet physically together, but now much more when you cannot meet physically together, continue to work out your salvation in fear and trembling. But one may well ask, what does Paul mean when he says we must continue to work out our salvation? This sounds just like the opposite of what Paul stresses so strongly in Romans, Galatians, Ephesians, and elsewhere. Paul has always written that it's not our deeds that cause us to be saved. It is being saved by faith through grace alone. So one may well ask, isn't Paul contradicting himself here? In Ephesians, he wrote this, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. What does Paul mean by saying that we are continue to work out our salvation, and particularly to do so with fear and trembling? And remember, this is a letter to those at Philippi, who are commended in their partnership in the gospel from the very first day to the time when this letter was being written. But I think it's important to note that Paul is not contradicting himself here, and he's not detracting in any way at all from the statement that salvation is by grace through faith alone. William Barclay wrote this, Work out your own salvation. The Greek word he uses for work out is one which always has the idea of bringing to completion. It is as if Paul says, don't stop halfway. Go on until the work of salvation is fully achieved in you. No Christian should be satisfied with anything less than the total benefit of the gospel. So Paul's statement that we are to work out our salvation must not be seen as, uh, in any way as a reference to our attempting to achieve our salvation by works. Rather, it is an instruction for us to continue on our spiritual journey, growing spiritually and developing in maturity. Paul is underlining the fact that salvation is not a call once and for all with nothing to be done after that. He's urging those at Philippi to be strenuously involved in the ongoing process. The writer of Hebrews puts it like this, We've come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. If indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. What does Paul mean when he says that we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling? I think it's important to know that this is not fear and trembling at the prospect of punishment. It comes, I believe, from two things. One, our own helplessness to deal with life in our own strength. And secondly, that we are to act with awe and reverence for God. We do not want to disappoint God, not act in the way that God would have us act. And so we are to work out our salvation in fear or with fear and trembling. But Paul goes on. He doesn't just leave those at Philippi at that point. He reassures them further. And we read that Paul says this, For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. And here Paul uses a different word for work, not the word meaning to complete, but the word used of the action of God, effective action of God. So as we continue on our journey of salvation, God is with us. We're not called on to journey on in our own strength. But it is important to understand that we have a part to play 
as we respond to what has been done. James puts it like this, you see that his faith and his actions were working together. Do you hear that? His faith and his actions working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. William Barclay writes that without our cooperation, God is helpless. Every gift has to be received. A doctor, for example, might prescribe medicine, which if taken by the patient would lead to a cure. But if the patient does not take the medication, no cure will follow. He writes this, there can be no salvation without God, but what God offers, we must take. It is never God who withholds salvation. We are responsible for depriving ourselves of it. These first 13 verses of Philippians chapter 2 need to be read again and again, and I would commend that you do so in the week that lies ahead. Paul starts out by continuing with the theme of joy, asking those at Philippi to make his joy complete. Make his joy by, uh, complete by not just considering themselves, but by considering the interests of others and by imitating Christ's humility. He goes on then in poetic form to describe the humiliation of Christ and also Christ's exaltation in beautiful words. And he concludes these 13 verses by reminding those at Philippi and us that we have a major part to play. And our part is one of continuing action in response to what God has already done for us. But we have God helping us to bring our salvation to completion for his good purpose. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this reminder that we have a very important part to play in our journey of faith, in our journey of salvation, and that we need intentionally to pray about this as we work out our salvation in fear and trembling, not in the sense frightened or terrified but fear, Lord, that we may not act in the way that you would have us act. Thank you for the reassurance, Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, that you are with us on this journey. Give us strength, give us encouragement, give us guidance, open doors for us, and give us the power to move when we need to move ahead. Help us not to be fearful in any way, but to know that you, Jesus, have gone ahead of us in every possible way. We thank you for this in your precious and wonderful name. Amen. Thank you for being with us this morning, and I pray that you will have a very good week as you go ahead. There are two songs that we have selected for this morning, and I, I would commend that you listen to them. The first one is The Power of the Cross, and the second is Salvation's Song. Please listen to those words and enjoy the beautiful music. Thank you for joining us this morning. And now the benediction, now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with and abide with each one of you now and forever. Amen. Love before the dawn of time.